As Nigeria's public debt surpasses 35 trillion naira, calls for the cutting of cost of governance intensify, even though the government spending only seems to be increasing. And the People's Democratic Party PDP expresses dis uh, belief that the ruling APC has a hand in the attack of Justice Mary Odili's residence. Well, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anacol. For quite some time now, several stakeholders have advocated for a cut in the cost of governance. However, it seems the Nigerian government is only interested in amassing more debt, as this has been on the increase in recent times. For instance, in 2022, the president's office will spend 1.6 billion naira on new vehicles, the fourth largest of any government in office. Now, that comes just a year after uh, the office spent nearly half a billion on the same item. Also, personal cost has continued to rise yearly, despite the government not conducting a major recruitment. Uh, in 2022, there are hopes that um, the government will spend 350 billion more on personal costs and 167 billion more than it did in 2021. Well, joining us to discuss this is Ladipa Johnson. He is a legal practitioner. Kofi Tells is a broadcast journalist. And Richard F. Inoyo is a financial analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Good evening. Great. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Richard, because um, we're talking about lo lots of money here. And, you know, um, it's very interesting because there seems to, to be a case of inflation that has... Um, not been explained so far to us as Nigerians. But then we see the government um, spending billions on vehicles, and this is barely a year after they had done so. Now, we're a cash-trapped government. We all know that the government in the country uh, is facing money problems. We've been borrowing. Um, and we know that the government is trying everything in its power to you know, make sure that they meet all of their uh, budgets except for the fact that um, they're most interested in buying cars. And I'm wondering, if we're borrowing monies to um, you know, fund our budgets, why spend that same money that we're looking for on expensive vehicles? Well, let me start by saying, uh, I don't even think the issue is the cars, they are budgeting for, basically. Because over the last, as in, five years plus we've spent away about five billion on cars that's not where my concern is the major concern i have right now is not about the cars the major concern i have is in the area of software for instance we're spending close to about 19 billion naira on software that simply means we're spending close to about uh, uh 10 times even what we're spending on cars and that should call for concern okay so the car i think it's just something that leaders Tends to, tends to do because they won't want to use any car that is older than either six months or nine months or a year. But when you look into the fact that as a country where we're calling for so much as in caught in administrative costs, we're seeing a president telling us that they're going to spend 19 billion naira on software. The question would have been, what kind of software do we need, okay, that we have to spend 19 billion naira for? These are things I believe that Nigerians are supposed to focus on, not necessarily on the car. For me, 1.6 billion for cars, though, start, but I know for sure that there's no way any president, especially the one we have in Nigeria, would want to drive one particular car or a few set of cars but it, for but, the but next as much as, as much as you're playing down on it, it's, it's one point something billion naira that could have been put in healthcare. It's one point something billion naira that could have been put in education and you're playing down on it. So I'm wondering how important is that cat to the president as opposed to the health of people in areas where there are waterborne diseases or, for example, um, you know, health posts that are no longer working? Which one should be prioritized over which? 
Well, I agree with you. We are not running from the fact that the policy in itself angers Nigerians. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying that even though the entire country is focused on cars for 1.6 billion naira, I'm thinking that as a country, we're supposed to also shift our searchlights to software that cost the country 19 billion naira. That is huge for me. I don't care what the president wants to tell Nigerians. When it gets to the point where we have to spend up to 19 billion for software, it's raised concern. So the truth here is that what we've seen over the years is the lack of sincerity, the lack of focus, the lack of parity on the part of this government. So this government seems not to care about the feelings, seems not to care about the sensitivity that Nigerians bring to the fore when it comes to the issue of budgeting. And let me put it to you clearly. Even this 1.6 billion is an indication that what we have in Nigeria is not evidence-based budgeting. Rather, what we have is just a few set of persons allocating national reserves to themselves in the name of budgeting. And that, for me, is something that we all need to look into. Why we are also calling for, as in the president, as a show restraint on what the president spend on food, on food and all the expenses. I used to think Nigerians need to start raising issues and raising questions around software that would cost this country 19 billion naira. All right. Um, very important point that you uh, picked out, um, Richard. I'm going to come back to you for more analysis. But I'm coming to you, Kofi, because <laughs> um, you are a journalist and uh, one of the responsibilities of journalists is to um, you know, pick these holes or find out these important um, parts of our budget and bring it to light. Uh, for example, Richard is saying that the 1.6 billion is not as important as the 19 billion under the subhead of, um, you know, <laughs> software. And these are um, areas that we should be questioning. But again, how many people are really interested or even have the knowledge about what's happening within the budget? We hear about the budget hearings, the presentations that are being made. But the average Nigerian is worried about the price of food in the market, the, uh, the price of gas that might be 10,000 naira next year, and all the other simple things. So... Which Nigerian, other than the, you and I and a couple of us who are interested in what's happening within the budget, would be questioning um, all of these things under these ambiguous uh, subheads? The middle class. The middle class that has continued to um, keep quiet in the face of several injustices in Nigeria are the ones who are aware, I mean, no, some would argue there's an absence of of a real middle class in the sense of the word in Nigeria, but you know what I mean. Uh, these, these are people who have a university degree. These are people who drive a car to work and have an office job or have a business they own. These are people who pay for their monthly subscriptions and different things like data. These people know what this means. And these are the people like you and I who should be speaking up about things like this. I mean, for a country that has consistently run a budget deficit since 2016, uh, or 2015, Marianne, um, you know, they say you should not spend what you don't have, live within your means. Nigeria right now is like a man who is borrowing uh, to fund a lavish lifestyle. Um, it's a man who is saying, you know, give me money, I need to pay for my, my children's school fees, please give me money, I need to buy some food for the house, and, and all that, then goes to a, a, a pub or a, a, a nightclub and spends it on Dorime. That's what Nigeria is in right now. So we need to speak up. I mean, 16.4 trillion naira budget for 2022, and you have a shuffle of more than 6 trillion naira, a recurrent expenditure of more than 4 trillion naira, uh, meaning that for every 160 naira the government spends, 16 naira will be borrowed and 40 naira will go to financing government operations. For every 160 naira the government spends, 60 naira will be borrowed. And out of that 60 naira, 40 naira will go to finance government operations. I mean, that, that, that's more than 50% of what they're borrowing. So in other words, they're borrowing and the majority of what they're using, which is out of 60 naira, 40 naira, is going to just fund the lifestyle of government. You know, so, so whether it's software or whether it's vehicles, the fact is that this government came into power in 2015, you know, telling Nigerians this is what we need to know. We need to cut down on government spending. I remember there was a time they were saying they were not going to even print stationery or government um, uh, souvenirs and all that, to try and cut down on, on, on but, but here we are. 
It's, it's spending with reckless abandon. Nigeria is digging itself into a hole, a hole that might all spell to me because it's not taken for the future generations. And the Nigerians who know what this means need to speak up. Um, Mr. Johnson, this is um, a president who promised that he was going to cut the cost of governance. For a president who preaches prudence, a president who in his first tenure, the very first few months, he and his VP halved their salaries and we're asking other government officials to do the same. And we're in 2021 talking about lavish cars and um, ambiguous subheads in our budgets for a government that promised to fight corruption. Where, what does this say about that government and where does this leave us as a country? Um, there are people who make a case that there's nothing wrong with borrowing. Yes, there isn't anything wrong with borrowing, but how do we spend that money and what does the future hold for the results of how we spend that money? Yes, um, it's, um, it's an unfortunate situation. And, um, but um, as um, Kofi Bartel said, the problem here is with the middle class. Um, we have fallen asleep. We're still asleep. There's no electricity, you decide to run your generator. There's insecurity, you decide to buy um, guard dogs. Uh, there's no water, you dig your own uh, borehole and you think you're all right. It's going to implode one of these days. It cannot continue this way. This government has failed to cut any costs, not just the executive. Look at the legislature. I'm, uh, I'm a member of the legal profession, and you see how the um, judiciary spending money at the moment as well, going for conferences overseas. Uh, it's as if the Naira hasn't fallen. It's as if it isn't more expensive to do these things. And they keep going on and on. The three arms of government, of course, the two um, guilty um, arms are the legislature and the executive. But the bottom line is that they will not stop. Um, this government, the executive, has shown that it lacks the willpower to bring about the positive change it preached to the people. I should say we preached to the people. I was part of them at that time. But there's been no positive change. There's been change quite all right, but everything's going um, southwards. It's going down. So look at the budget over the years. Just look at, look at the um, presidential villa and look at the budget head on uh, uh, cutlery, for instance and see what you've seen year in, year out. Then you know that we're just, uh, it's just a joke. So unless, and we've reached the stage where you're borrowing to um, pay your um, recurrent expenditure, pay for recurrent expenditure, and about 70% or what have you, God knows what we're spending on uh, servicing our debts. Um, Mr. Johnson, are you still there? Um, I think that we lost Mr. Johnson briefly there, but let me come back to you, Richard, quickly. Now, there's a, an analysis um, from the, the tabloid um, Premium Times. Um, I'd like to just quote them directly. They're saying that the revenues... Um, that we're getting as a country are simply inadequate to fund fundamental expenditure. Therefore, every available fund should be spent with the greatest value for money. Um, it has to be tied to high-level national policy framework and aimed at improving livelihoods. It's also saying that um, it has to be something that would grow the economy, reduce poverty and inequality. Um, and and th th this is something that we don't see happening. So... Um, if the monies are not being targeted in those areas, what do we do? Because again, you're talking about the second class um, citizens, um, even though we may not necessarily know the difference between that class and you know, the, the people who are in the third class 
or people who were poor. Um, but then, how do we get those people in that cadre to be able to speak up? Because yes, we, they might be able to get by, but for how long? Again, it's dawning on all of us that things are getting worse. So what do we do as a financial person, as somebody who's analyzing you know, um, the budgets year in, year out, someone who's looking at how um, the inflation is rising and falling every single day, how do we get people to jump on this conversation? Because it seems not even to be happening. We just grumble on our coffee tables or on our breakfast tables or in beer parlors, and that's it. Well, well, let me start by saying, as a country, we don't have ideology, okay? That's where it starts from. We don't have ideology. So what we have, we just have political parties where people choose to join those political parties for specific interests they have. So it's not necessarily because they have an ideology. So as long as people don't have ideology, you'll find it difficult for them to even join the conversation or to lead specific conversations. So that is where we are right now. So how do you get people to basically start speaking up? You have to create centers for ideological development. You have to create centers for ethical consciousness. You have to create a network of centers where people would be enlightened. That way they come to realize why they need to speak up. That's one, two. You need to also understand that we are currently in the police states. This is a state where uh, people are being killed, people are being arrested just because they choose to speak up or because they choose to protest against the government where they feel the government policies is not in line with building the right future for Nigerians. So the issue here is how do you guarantee safety of people speaking up? Mm. That is another thing. So there are several institutional issues that we must first of all address for you to get people to speak up. It's not as if people don't want to speak up, but once you're done speaking up, what happened next? This is a country where we've seen military leaders being murdered. So all of these issues are there, okay? So if you're going to get people to speak up, first you have to create a network of centers with different mandates and responsibility to enlighten and to build consciousness in the lives of Nigerians. That's one. Two, you also need to look for a way to ensure security of people. And you cannot get that done without making emphasis on human rights protection, freedom of the press, and expounded civic society. So it all boils down to taking what I call the long walk, okay, to building the right infrastructural as a system that allows people to be able to get their voice aired. I, I appreciate now, I appreciate how you rolled this out, out Richard. I, I, I appreciate how you rolled all of this out. You, you tried to talk about the problems and the solutions. But then when you say we, 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 who's we? Because the power, unfortunately, lies at the center. And just as you said, people have been killed because they spoke up. Um, so all of these beautiful ideas that you're rolling out, who's the we that's going to implement it? Because I cannot ensure security. I can only ensure security for myself. And that's limited to where I go, what I say, and what I do. So when you say we, are we taking the responsibilities of government and security agencies on ourselves? Or what exactly do you mean? The truth here, if you listen to the Prime Minister, Abi Ahmed of Ethiopia, he, he spoke recently and he said that citizens in Ethiopia need to pick up arms to protect themselves because they are being faced, okay, by the existential threat of rebel coming into their country. So I don't know if that is true or false in respect to those who are coming into the country. But the primary thing here is that that man basically made it clear that citizens should protect themselves when their life is threatened. But it's now, not the, the job of the citizens of country, to, 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 to but it's not the job of the citizens to protect themselves. Prime Minister Abe Ahmed took an oath of office promising, which is his number one responsibility, to protect the lives of his citizens. Now there's a war in Tigray, for those who do not know. What is happening in Tigray is obviously what's spilling over. And the TPLF is trying to uh, spread its tentacles. But that's a man-made problem, not necessarily something that the people of Ethiopia should be taking arms to protect themselves. It's a political issue that needs a political no, I, solution. I, 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 agree, I agree with you. I'm coming to a particular as inside of the conversation. And that is the side of self-defense. Basically, we're in a country right now where people are being murdered. In cross the states, 
we've had several kidnappings. So the issue here is that even while we're hoping that government will live up to one of its responsibility of ensuring security, it still boils down to how do you defend yourself when you face, okay, with threat of life. So I believe that the citizen, Nigerians as a whole, must recognize three things. One, they must recognize that as citizens, it is in their interest to produce governments. And that is one of the responsibility of citizens. Unfortunately, in this country, people are not so much interested in how we produce our leaders. If you look at the statistics out there, in respect to those who come out to vote, you discover that the turnover is always low. That's one. Two, it is also very important to realize that when government fails to live up to certain responsibility, and when you know that your life might be threatened in the process, it calls upon your own human instincts to find a way to protect yourself. So my interns must learn okay to figure out ways to ensure their security why they are calling on government to do the right thing okay. because unfortunately we're still dealing with what i call go ahead yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was waiting for you to land because i mean this is, this is a conversation that we have to have on another day but i want to quickly go to the um the other guests so that we can wrap this up but thank you richard um kofi i'm coming back to you and but you know just taking up from where um richard stopped um we have somewhat become a government for ourselves. We grade our own roads and sometimes tar them. And just like uh, Mr. Johnson said, you dig your own borehole, you produce, you provide your own lights. You, we've even gone beyond buying generators now to getting inverters because we need light and we need to be able to sustain our businesses where governments and th thugs also come to harass you. So it's, we've become a government to, to ourselves somewhat, but, um, have we gotten to a point of fatigue? Have we resigned to fate? Could that also be responsible for the reason why we're not necessarily screaming at the top of our voices anymore? We just keep managing. Um, if we're pushed to the wall, we just create some more space within the wall and stay there. So is that where we are? Because there's some, some um, uh, lethargic rea um, reaction to government issues these days. Mm. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, uh, when you keep you keep complaining about the same thing over and over and over again, you keep uh, shouting about the same thing over and over and over again. At some point, you will get you get tired. At some point, you just get exhausted, and at some point, you will give up. I mean, um, Nigerians have been shouting about several things uh, for some years now, and those things have not changed. And um, yeah, some sort of fatigue has set in, some sort of um, tiredness has set in. It's normal as far as human beings are concerned. You know, um, so, you know, typical thing for, you know, uh, someone on the street to say will be, or in a beer parlor somewhere, or on a radio station, so not them, not their way, not so them be, you know, not so politicians be, leave them, make them do their thing, like that. you know, I mean, the president is, is, is traveled to um, uh, at least, at least, um, uh, seven major cities in six countries in the last eight weeks. And this is meant to be uh, a country where you have uh, a budget deficit since 2015. And by the way, one of your guests was asking, what is the, you know, what's the debt service, you know, uh, uh, figure and all that. Well, in 2021, the, the amount of money Nigeria made from crude oil sales or was expected projected to make from crude oil sales is this exact same amount of money uh, or just about the same amount of money Nigeria was meant to use to service its debt. You know, so it may, basically means that the nation is making nothing from crude oil sales, which is basically uh, zero. So, so I think fatigue is set in, but that is where we need to have voices, voices to stand up and galvanize Nigerians. People just need someone. You see one person, two people, three people. Look at the answers protest. People were at home until they saw certain persons on the streets and then they came out too. All right, they came out too. So we need to have voices. Unfortunately, the leading opposition party in Nigeria, being the PDP, um, is really not um, you know, any different from what we're seeing uh, from the, the, the current incumbent administration right now. They're basically the same. Most of the political parties and the politicians you have on the opposition aisle of, of, of the Nigerian political system are the same. You know, And that's why it's easy for them to cross carpet. Otherwise, the opposition politicians and political parties should have been the ones on the tail of government, but they're not doing that. So Nigerians need, need a voice. They need some person, some intellectuals or intelligentsia, uh, the people who know what to do. Like uh, the great philosophers of old said, 
to stand up and speak. People who have the interests of the country at heart. And um, when these people stand up and speak and and and, and rally people, uh, people will rise up and also follow them as well. Interesting. Uh, Mr. Johnson, over to you. Sarah, civil society organizations, even individuals, have over the years challenged some of the questionable spendings of government, especially under this administration, uh, day in, day out, especially Sarah. It's, they're always in the news, you know, challenging this or that, um, even down to the political parties asking that they make their finances open. Um, but most of these cases and these suits, you know, just pile up and nothing really comes of it. So the question again is, um, where does the judiciary, you know, come in in all of this? Because, you know, uh, when I was on the radio, you'd hear lots of people say, oh, that's the last hope of the common man. But is that really still a hope for the common person? Well, well, it is. Um, and we pray that it continues to be. Because the moment the common man has no hope, then the man, the common man takes to the streets. And the first people who will suffer are the middle classes, because we live amongst them. It will take them a while to get to Ikoyi, I assure you. Mm -hmm. By the time they get to Ikoyi, the police will be there. But look at what happened with the NSARs. Those that were in Jack on Day just went across and dealt with the shop rights and everything in the area. So the middle classes have to realize that it behoves on us to make sure, to make certain that we do not get tired, that we're, that we're not fatigued, that we continue to talk, we continue to speak. And as Kofi said, it takes a few good men and women. It doesn't, you don't need um, the whole uh, country or whole community. No, 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 no. It takes a few people to bring about the change. And um, we just have to begin to work towards that begin to organize. It's all about organize. You have to get people going, talking to them, bring people with different interests together, and let them realize that cutting corners might be good for you as an individual. But overall, it brings down the country. If you cannot do the small or little things the right way, the big things will not fall into place. It's not, it's not magic. Hmm. And finally, um, just... I always call Nigeria organized chaos. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before, before, before um, the network uh, disconnected, I was going to add something quickly. We have also seen the disobedience of court orders, you know, over and over yeah. again. Uh, and the biggest story in the news is the attack on the justice. Um, uh, number three uh, you know in in the country again it takes me back to the question i asked earlier on how empowered how independent how strong is the nigerian judiciary as we speak in today's nigeria under the buhari administration can we really be sure that if we decide today to say we as a people are challenging this government to court on this and that, that those cases will see the light of day. Just quickly coming. I think the only thing we have is that's the only thing we have. We have to keep hope alive, but I believe that our judiciary, the way it's constituted, is open to all kinds of control from the executive. Maybe we have to actually reinvent our judiciary in such a way that how we end up having judges in our courts and how we end up having the Supreme Court justice, maybe we can get them to pay election and not necessarily, not necessarily appointments. If we achieve that, maybe we may just be able to have stronger judiciary from what we currently have. Because as long as they are not independent in respect to how they emerge and lead the courts, 
there is no way they won't be under the wings and caprices of the executive. That's one. But most importantly, Nigerians must continuously ask for stronger institutions by putting government on the pressure to ensure that our institutions work better and efficiently to deliver the justice we need as citizens. All right, quickly, Kofi, uh, as we wrap up. A Vanguard newspaper journalist got missing. Um, it took a whole row for even the National Assembly to speak of it. And they were still, I remember watching the last time I saw uh, anything from the National Assembly, the speaker was saying, well, we're, st we're still investigating. Uh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, there was nothing really serious um, being done. And then all of a sudden, um, his body was found dead, obviously. Um, and we've also seen all kinds of, you know, darts thrown in the direction of the, uh, the you know, the media, knowing that, um, again, the, they're the fourth estate. They're the ones who put, uh, supposedly, uh, to create the platforms for people to have these conversations and, of course, question the government. Um, do you see the media also experiencing some fatigue or is the media growing um, and getting more strengths and more information to speak up about these things? Or have they also joined the second class? Um, well, I mean, the media is part of Nigeria. You know, the media is a sector in, in the country. Um, and so whatever affects Nigeria or Nigerians affects the media. Um, but I wouldn't say that the media dropped the ball or uh, has fatigue over this issue because, I mean, whenever a journalist is affected by a negative situation, we see that other media houses, other people in the journalism profession are able to uh, rally together to demand for action. We've seen uh, the uh, Nigerian Union of Journalists in particular um, taking the lead as well as, well as other um, journalism, you know, associations, for instance, those from the Middle Belt and Benue State and all that, coming together to to speak about this. This story has had uh, coverage in the media, so I don't think we we have uh, as a collective um, section uh, uh, of the Nigerian, you know, um, nation, you know, any apathy or any fatigue. No, no, no. We've been talking about this. But of course, as human beings, you know, you'll get tired, you'll get worn out. But we've been talking about this. Uh, every now and then when something happens to a member of the media fraternity, we wake up. I mean, in my case, when I was brutalized by uh, uh, officers of the Nigerian police uh, who were working for the SWAL SARS, you know, media organizations around the country stood up. You know, in the case of um, the uh, Wazobi FM presenter who was um, kidnapped in Port Harcourt, it was all over the place. So at least these ones wake us up, if at all, we go to sleep. Um, and I think that the coverage hasn't been that bad. But, well, uh, time will tell whether the story you're being told is believable or not. Uh, we're watching and we're speaking. Well, I want to say thank you. Ladipo Johnson is a legal practitioner. Unfortunately, his connection went tough. Uh, Kofi Batels is a broadcast journalist and um, Richard Inouye is a financial analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. Thanks thank for having you. me. Good night. Thank All you. Right. We'll take a quick break. When we return, the PDP believes the APC has a hand in the attack of Justice Mary Odili's residence. We'll talk about it shortly. Stay with us. <laughs>